How's it going, everybody? Nerds Rising here, and welcome back to the Nerd Cave. In today's video, I'm going to be doing something a little bit different than I normally do. We are going to be taking a look at some fun battles, this time in the Master Premier Classic, but rather than showing them a little bit faster and more of them and kind of just briefly talking through my thoughts as I'm playing, I'm going to slow them down just a little bit, and we're going to break down the battles in a little bit more detail, and I'm going to give you guys some very valuable tips and strategies that I've picked up on, some for myself, a lot of them from different content creators that I've been watching over the years, and I really think that a lot of these concepts are really core to the way you can succeed at GBL. Now, this list by no means is comprehensive. Honestly, there are just so many different strategies out there. I could probably make a video about every single one of them individually, but instead I'm just going to show you guys four or five different kind of tips that you can bring to your everyday play. So let me know in the comments what you think of this format. Again, this is not something I normally do, but I figured it's time to maybe break things down a little bit because there's so many different players of different skill levels that are watching this, and I know that over the years I've learned so much from watching good battlers. So. I think the least I can do for you guys is help, even if I just help one of you guys, then I think this video will be a success. So again, let me know in the comments what you think. But that being said, let's get into the footage and let's see what we can do with this team. All right, so the first section we're gonna be getting into is gonna be called Lost Leads. You can see my team comp over there, Gyarados, Mamoswine, Ursa Luna, a water double ground team, where basically the back line is gonna be covering the Gyarados' weaknesses of rock and electric. And the Gyarados is going to, be, going to be covering the back line's weakness of primarily things like fighters, as well as things like grass types, which hopefully we don't see because our whole team's kind of weak to those. But uh, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be using Mamoswine as a safe switch. Mamoswine is just generally a lot safer based on its moves and typings than Ursa Luna. And you're going to see me play out of a couple very difficulty leads, and I'm going to explain to you how I do that. So in the first match, we have a Magnezone, a Shadow Magnezone lead. So really, really bad. So right away, right away I know that obviously I have to get out of there. I cannot stay in that lead for any amount of time. So I'll be safe switching into the Mamoswine because Mamoswine, again, it's a bit safer, but it's also my soft counter because it is part ice. So the Magnezone could still hit the Mamoswine for super effective damage with those mirror shots. But I know that the opponent's not going to be staying into a, a, a matchup against the ground type. So I know he's going to be switching out. So that's why I bring in the Mamoswine, hoping that my Ursa Luna will eventually be aligned to this in the end game. So I bring in the Mamoswine, and they bring in a Haxorus, which is a Dragon type. So it is taking super effective from the Powder Snows, but it is hitting us for super effective damage. And here, you see me let this go, knowing that I can survive this move comfortably and still get off my move. Because if I shield that, he still basically can just match shields and still farm me down, and he will still have switch advantage. So I knew that I was not going to be sw winning switch advantage here, and that's super important, because if I shield there, the, p the opponent still has switch advantage, and now we're in even shields, whereas by recognizing I can survive that move and still get off mine, I basically allowed myself to have some sort of advantage, and that's going to be shield advantage. So what I'm going to be doing is now waiting my full clock, that way, when that Magnezone comes back in, my Gyarados is not switch locked in. So I will be bringing this Gyarados, and I will be farming this thing down fully, because health on my Gyarados is not very valuable with a Shadow Magnezone in play. So I'm just going to farm this thing all the way down, let him hit me with as many moves as he gets to. He should probably only get to one, since he did throw his move right away against our Mamoswine. And we're going to farm down right away, and as you see, my switch clock is just coming up. So if I don't wait my switch clock there, I'm locked in. And now the opponent comes in with a Gyarados, which in the two shield matchup isn't the best situation for the Ursa Luna, but we now have a shield advantage, and a Thunder Punch nearly one-shots the Gyarados. So what's he going to do? He actually lets it go, and then the opponent basically just realizes this game is over, and he surrenders. So I'm going to pause it right there. We're just going to go back to the end scene there. So the opponent lets it go, and really, even if he doesn't let that go, let's just pretend that he shields it and then he gets to his Aqua Tail, I simply just shield the Aqua Tail, and I still have a shield. I then get to my next Thunder Punch, I take out the Gyarados, and now I have a nearly full health Ursa Luna into their Magnezone, and that's a good game because Mirror Shots do nothing, and we double resist the Electric type. So there, even though I wasn't able to win Switch on my safe swap, 
I was able to effectively get myself a nice shield advantage, which allowed my Ursa Luna to sweep in the endgame. So that's one way that you can use an ABB style team like this to flip lost leads. And as you see, um, that's that's honestly, again, probably the worst matchup you could have a, a Magnazone in. As you're going to see in the next battle, we're going to have the same exact lead. I think this time it's a regular, no, actually it's another Shadow Magnazone. And again, we're going to try and play it the same way. We're going to be bringing in the Mamoswine here. And the opponent this time does a couple extra um, sparks, and now he brings in an Excadrill. And right away, this is a different type of battle than the last one. In the last battle, I recognized right away I was not going to be able to win Switch, so I decided to take my shield advantage. But in this battle, I'm realizing that I can definitely take back Switch advantage. Because Excadrill, it's very spammy, but the nice thing here is that we can survive one drill run. And I know that we can comfortably. So basically, the opponent's going to have to get to four drill runs before I get to three avalanches. No reason to go for the high horsepower, because after these powder snows add up, this, this Excadrill is easily going to be in avalanche range. So I know all, already that no matter what happens here, I can take back Switch. And I know that I basically need to at all costs. So I'm going to match shields. As you saw, I let that first drill run go. But now I will be shielding every drill run that he gets to. And I will be over farming as well, hoping to throw off the opponent's counts. Because what I'm hoping is that the opponent doesn't recognize that I'm going to be able to win Switch and that he commits both shields. That way I can get shields down for my Ursa Luna. But as you're going to see, the opponent very wisely recognizes that I was going to win Switch, which I think is the right play. So he maintains even shields, and now he's going to come in here with his Mamoswine and farm us down. And here you're going to see me throw the, highest, the high horsepower, knowing that I'm only getting to one move and high horsepower does slightly more damage. So that's why I throw that, and he does commit his last shield. So we're not out of the woods yet, but again, I'm going to bring in the Gyarados here, knowing that it has very, very little play with that Magnazone still on the field. And I'm just going to tank this move. I need to save my shield for the Ursa Luna. And I'm realizing the opponent's very likely going to throw this Avalanche and then dip out right away. And he does. And as you see there, I bank an Aqua Tail before I dip into the Ursa Luna, which is very important. And now the Magnazone's coming in. And the Magnazone is not prepared for our Ursa Luna. We've now taken back Switch Advantage. And as you see, those Mirror Shots do absolutely nothing. And I bet you Ursa Luna could probably take five or six Mirror Shots before we're really even threatened to shield. So we're just going to keep farming up, get this high horsepower off. I may even slightly over farm, we'll have to see. Not really, I just basically went for it right away. I knew there was no way. Basically what I wanted to do there was just make sure that the opponent didn't stall at the switch clock there by throwing the mirror shot. So I just get rid of it right away. And now the Mambo Swine's coming in, but at this, at this point, as you saw, I banked the Aqua Tail. So there is no reason for me to shield this Ursa Luna. That would be a potential lose con. So I'm just going to let this thing go down. And we've got the Aqua Tail loaded, so this is now going to be a GG. So as you see there, two very, very brutal leads. And in one, we were able to give ourselves a shield advantage and overcome the lost lead. And in this one, we were actually able to win back Switch. And that's basically your two choices when you're playing this style of team. You either need to commit everything to win Switch, or if you're recognizing you can't win Switch, give yourself a shield advantage and hope that your back mon can sweep. All right, this next segment is going to be called Chip and Dip. And I have to say, I did not come up with that term. I heard it originally on Rise to the Occasions channel some time ago, like over a year ago. I'm not sure if he coined it or if he got it from someone else, but you will see what I mean when I say Chip and Dip. So we're just going to get right into this video. I think this is just one battle. So we'll have to see what our lead is. We have Gyarados on the lead into a, an opposing Gyarados, and we'll have to see what the move set is, and it's actually Waterfall. So this is a very nice lead for us, but then the opponent brings in a Primarina, which is not a very good matchup for our Gyarados, obviously. But again, it's also not the best matchup for our backline, and I definitely know that I want to maintain switch advantage here, because a Waterfall Gyarados is quite bad for our backline. As you see, two ground types definitely don't want to see this. So if I bring in one of my back mons right away, let's say I bring in the Ursa Luna, the opponent has the fast move of Charm. He may be able to, to double shield and Charm me all the way down and take back switch advantage. So I don't want that to happen. So what I'm going to do is something just I like to call chip and dip. And that's throw a move on this mon before I switch anything in. And what this is going to do is basically just guarantee that I keep switch advantage. Even though this crunch is resisted, 
it still does a decent amount after the Dragon Breasts add up. And I know that I'm still going to be able to outpace this to the first move. And that's very important because, again, this is going to put the pressure on the opponent to make the first shielding decision. Let's say that I had brought the Ursa Luna in right away. And let's say he gets to a move, I let it go, and then he commits both shields and farms down. But by getting my move off first, I make him make the first shielding decision. He shields, so then I'm going to shield, and now I know that I will be able to maintain switch advantage. So the chip damage was very important to make this a much easier matchup for my Ursa Luna. I'm able to match shields because of it, and now I still have switch advantage, and I still have a lot of energy to throw at this Gyarados when it comes in. And as you saw in one of the earlier battles, Thunder Punch does a lot of damage to Gyarados, so he shields it. He kind of has to, and we might even get to another one, and our Hundo Ursa Luna gets to another Thunder Punch. What an absolute monster. This thing is a beast. If this thing ever gets a better fast move, it's going to be absolute, absolutely meta-defining. So, we land a lot of damage on the Gyarados, and as you see, the, the opponent actually had a Togekiss in the back, so I think he does end up surrendering here, <clears throat> and he does, so... If we were to, say, have lost switch advantage, what that would have done is it would have aligned their Waterfall Gyarados onto our Mamoswine and our Dragon Breath Gyarados onto their Togekiss. So switch advantage was everything in winning that battle. And if I don't chip and dip there, the opponent may be able to double shield and make a play for switch advantage. So that's just a very simple thing you can do. If the opponent brings in a Mon to your lead, you don't have to feel pressure to switch out right away. You can get some damage off first and guarantee yourself switch advantage. So very simple tactic, but uh, I think this that plays in very nicely to our next category, and that staying in is okay. So what you're going to see in this battle, slightly different than the chip and dip, whereas in that, in that matchup I actually switched out after throwing some energy, but you're going to see me play this one a little bit different. We have a Garchomp lead, which is somewhat neutral, even though we're doing super effective damage to them. This is, as you see, a Dragon Tail Garchomp, and Dragon Tail Garchomp just out bulks us, and those Dragon Tails, as you see, are, are keeping pace with our Dragon Breast, but then the opponent brings in their own Gyarados, and this one has Waterfall. So what you're seeing, even though I had a decent lead, I'm actually going to be just staying in here. And I feel like a lot of times when the opponent switches, we kind of just panic, and we think, oh, they switch, I have to switch into something right away. And you really don't, because this is not a bad matchup. As you see here, I'm just going to pause for a second. This is really not a bad matchup for us because they're running Waterfall and we're running Dragon Breath. And again, I don't want my backline really to see this. And I also know that if I maintain Switch Advantage here, that my Mammoth Swine will end up aligned to their Garchomp in the endgame. So honestly, pretty good situation for us. So we're just going to stay in again, attempt to get our moves off first. And since I get my move off first, I now know that I should just barely be able to survive this crunch and still maintain Switch Advantage. And as you see, I cut it extremely close. I actually survive on 1 HP, but now we still have Switch Advantage. And even though our Gyarados is not aligned to their Garchomp, we now can put our Mamoswine on the Garchomp and have our Ursaluna for whatever they have in back. So they bring back in the Garchomp, perfectly fine. I'll bring back in the Mamoswine here. And we will just, we'll probably have to respect a potential Earth Power or Outrage here. Probably just gonna be a bait, but again, we're not gonna take any chances. And even though we're not going to be down a shield, we have basically two full health Mons, and their Garchomp is getting very low, and they have a Togekiss in the back. So again, switch advantage is very important in this matchup. And uh, we're going to be able to basically just get our Avalanche off, get even shields, and then we will switch out since we're debuffed. And we'll bring in the Ursa Luna, and this game is basically over at this point. Again, I'll make sure to get my move off first to make the opponent make the next shielding decision. And we'll have to see if they decide to shield. I'm guessing they kind of have to at this point because their Garchomp is basically dead. So they kind of have to shield and they don't. So now that they don't shield, this is game over. I, I'll just save my shield for the Mammoth Swine at this point, knowing that a couple more Powder Snows will take care of the Garchomp. And they even only Ancient Power my Ursa Luna, but I knew I could even survive a Flamethrower there. So that's going to be a good game. But again, you see there, when they bring in the Waterfall Gyarados, I don't panic. I don't immediately just switch into something thinking that I have to. I realize that it's not a bad matchup that I'm staying, that I'm switched into, and I'm realizing that I had another answer for their gar their Garchomp. So I just stay in, I play it out, and as you see, we win a pretty comfortable match in the end there. So good game to the opponent, and we're getting into the next one, which is going to be catching and counting. So catching and counting is one of those that honestly I could probably make an entire segment on just this, because obviously it's quite difficult to catch if you don't know how to count. So they kind of go hand in hand. But what you're going to see is, 
you don't necessarily always have to count the opponent's fast moves. If you have a move that's the same turn length as the opponent, you can just look at your own energy and know where the opponent is. So here, we have Dragon Breath and Tackle. And I know that these are the same energy. And I know that Thunder Punch is 40 energy, which is going to be slightly past my 35 energy Aqua Tail. So as you see there, I just do a couple tackles past my own Aqua Tail, and I catch the Thunder Punch. I was not counting that tackle there. Nope, does anyone actually count individual tackles? I don't know. I don't. But all I had to do there was look at my own energy, and I knew that it was going to be basically in between my Crunch and my Aqua Tail. So I catch there. And as you see, I catch a double resisted Thunder Punch onto my Mamoswine, which is absolutely huge. And then this actual mad lad is running Fire Punch on his Ursaluna. There I thought it was going to be another Thunder Punch, but he's actually running Fire Punch. But again, Mamoswine tanks it. And what we've done, we wasted a lot of their energy. We take out this Ursaluna and we banked a little bit past an Aqua Tail on our Gyarados. So we're in a pretty decent situation. And we actually maintained switch advantage there as well. So I can bring now my normal type into their Snorlax. Which even though Snorlax has superpower, we're going to be double resisting the Licks. And even the Shadow Snorlax doesn't hit particularly hard. So I know I'm not really going to be in danger of a superpower here. Again, Snorlax is super thick. So I'm not going to risk a bait. I'm just going straight for the high horsepower. Not expecting him to shield. And we land the high horsepower. So we're in an even better situation. And since we landed that... I know the opponent wasn't going to want to give up all that energy, so I actually bring the Gyarados in, in here and snipe and force them to shield to preserve that energy. And now they actually don't throw and they bring in a Dragonite. At this point, this game is over because I know I can tank a dra uh, Dragon Claw here. He actually chooses not to throw it, which is fine by me. But now, again, if he doesn't shield this Crunch, it's going to nearly KO. I guess it doesn't quite nearly KO, but that and the subsequent Dragon Breasts do nearly KO. And he realizes that he cannot farm down, so he's forced to throw. And at this point, I'm just going to give two shields to Ursaluna, because even though that Snorlax has a lot of energy, Ursaluna can tank that energy for days. So we farm down. Again, we're not in superpower range. I'm not going to risk getting baited by a body slam. So I'm just going to let this go, even if it's a superpower, which I do believe it is a superpower. It only does about half, and we're double resisting those licks, so we're not in danger of being farmed down. This is likely just going to be a body slam. But we're in such a dominant position here, I can safely just double shield. And as you see, we just farm down. So that was a pretty dominant win. And that simple counting and catch at the beginning of the game really put us in a, a huge advantage in that battle. So again, some people like to over farm. That was just kind of a call on my part. If I wouldn't have caught there, it might have been different. But again, we caught and uh, a nice win. So the next battle, really bad lead into Florges. Dragon Beth Breath Gyarados does not like Florges, and we safe switch into our Mamoswine as we always do, and we're met with another Shadow Snorlax, and what I'm hoping is that by over farming here, I can give the opponent a false sense of security that he can over farm and get to this next avalanche before he throws, but unfortunately he does not, so I do want to at least get one shield off this opponent, so I will, com I will commit the shield here, unfortunately just a body slam, we could have survived that, but a superpower definitely would have KO'd, so I'm fine with the shield there. And again, I'm going to continually over farm, trying to throw off the opponent's counts and hope that he allows me to get to another avalanche. But as you're going to see, he wisely was keeping track. He actually could have over farmed even a, a little bit more there. And this will probably be the superpower. I doubt he double baits me here. And it is a superpower. So this is fine. This is actually perfect because now I know I can come in and farm down with the Ursa Luna. And even though we do not win switch or shield advantage, we're going to give ourselves a very nice energy advantage. And since he threw right away, we should be able to farm all the way down and come out with almost a Thunder Punch loaded. And as you see, those licks did virtually no damage to our Ursaluna. So we still managed to give ourselves an advantage. And they come back in with a floor just so. Now I'm recognizing that they may very likely have a Steel type in the back if they don't want to see my Ground type. And also, they didn't bring in a super hard counter to my Mamoswine and Snorlax. So I'm recognizing there very well may be something in the back that's weak to fighting that a Snorlax would be likely trying to draw out so i'm expecting it to be probably a metagross or something like a steel type and it's actually an excadrill and here what you're gonna see we both landed the nukes on each other as you see in the last uh segment there the florges and the ursa luna so i'm almost in drill run range and i know that the opponent knows i'm getting somewhat close to a high horsepower so i'm expecting him to want to throw right away to just try to grab the ko or get my last shield so I'm not expecting him to over farm. So what I'm going to do is just simply the Excadrill comes in. I'm just going to count to five. As you see, 
and we're gonna catch a, a potential drill run on our Gyarados. Did we catch it? And we do catch the double resisted drill run. And why this is crucial, we are still not in one rock slide range. Gyarados can tank one rock slide from Excadrill. That's about two thirds of our health, but it cannot tank two. But since we wasted a full move catching that drill run, as you see, we tank the drill run and we tank the rock slide. And that's a huge, huge advantage for us in this endgame. Because even though Ursaluna is a ground type, it's very slow to charge up. And the Excadrill does resist our tackles. So I get my Aqua Tail off just before they get to their move. And they actually over farm there. I did still have a shield, so I think I would have been fine to just shield their move and KO the Excadrill. But since he over farmed, we just get our second Aqua Tail off. And now we still have a shield. We still have two Mons. The opponent realizes it's over. And he surrenders. So, as you see there, that catch really won me that game. I'm not sure I win that game if I don't catch. And what I recognize is that a lot of times over farming is nice, but in certain situations, I realized the opponent was not able to over farm. So I simply just counted to five, knowing that's how many it takes to get to a drill run, and made a game winning catch on my Gyarados there. So, good game to the opponent. And we're getting into the next segment. All right, so the last segment here, predicting the team. This is probably the most ambiguous of the strategies because number one, it assumes that your opponent is making teams that make sense, that are balanced. And it also can fail because it's purely speculation because you obviously don't know what the opponent has in back. You can make your best guess. And there's certain things you can do to help you predict the line. And you're gonna see that in this very last battle of this video. So we're getting into it here. Uh, as you see, I did get up to 2660 with this team, so definitely not bad. Um, and we're getting into the battle here. We have a Gyarados lead into a Haxorus. So I'm going to pause right here. Basically, Haxorus, we know Haxorus is a dragon, a pure dragon type, and it's running the move of counter. And most, most often they run Night Slash and Dragon Claw as their charge move. So right away, you know that Haxorus is extremely weak to things like fairies like a togekiss or something like a dragonite so right away i'm thinking the opponent definitely has to have a response to those in the back and the best response to dragonite and a togekiss is going to be something like a steel type like metagross and what you're going to see here another thing that cues me into that is that the opponent is actually staying into a pretty bad matchup we're resisting the counters and we're doing super effective with our dragon breast so right away the opponent's staying in and trying to chip and dip me we talked about earlier so i'm thinking he very well is weak in the back to my gyarados and what's a very common thing in this meta that's weak to gyarados metagross so right away i'm thinking very likely going to be a metagross in the back so the opponent does throw the dragon claw i do not respect it it doesn't do too much damage and then he brings in a dragon breath or a dragon tail gyarados excuse me so again you're going to see me chip and dip knowing that not my backline doesn't really want to see gyarados and i do want to maintain switch advantage so I, there's the chip and dip. We bring in the Ursa Luna, knowing that we can tank one Aqua Tail, especially since, especially since the opponent's not running Waterfall. And I'm counting here as well. So I know that he's one Dragon Tail away from a second Aqua Tail. So I get my move off right away. I don't over farm. And again, that's going to pressure the opponent to make the first shielding decision. So we'll have to see what he decides to do. And I think he correctly lets it go, recognizing that I'm probably going to farm him down. Um... And then they bring back in the Hexorus, but since I, I have a beastly Ursa Luna here, I'm actually able to get to another move, and this is going to force probably a shield from the opponent. And here's again where you're going to see where reading the line is very, very important. So we get the shield, we're in 2 to 1 shielding situation, I bring in the Gyarados, and the opponent throws a move. So right away, I'm reading that there's a Metagross in the back. If you look at my Gyarados' health, we're getting fairly low. And we are running Dragon Breath, which makes the Metagross matchup a little bit worse. A Crunch, along with the Dragon Breath, only does slightly over half on the Metagross. And I know that my Mammoth Swine in the back is going to be taking super effective bullet punch damage from the Metagross. And I also know that Mammoth Swine and Metagross get to their Meteor Mash and high horsepower at the same rate. Eight fast moves and then seven on the second. So what I know is that if my Mammoth Swine and, and Metagross are going at each other, with one-to-one -one shields with even energy metagross will win cmp against my mammoth swine so i know that i definitely either need a shield advantage 
or an energy advantage on the Mamoswine. So, and I also realized that if the opponent comes in with a Metagross here and farms down my Gyarados, let's say I, sh I shield this move by the Hexorus, the Metagross could come in and farm down my Gyarados, tank the crunch, and then double Meteor Mash my Mamoswine. Or, if he, say I am in the Metagross matchup, say he lets his Hexorus go down, I shield the Dragon Claw, and then I realize, oh crap, he's going to farm me down, and I switch in the Mamoswine. Now he has a very nice energy lead on me, and he just outpaces me. So what I decide to do here, thinking there's going to be a Metagross in the back, I actually let this go, knowing that my Mamoswine is going to need a, like I said, either a shield or energy advantage. So we actually bring the Mamoswine in here. Unfortunately, he does get to another move, so we're not going to have a shield advantage, but we have a two Powder Snow head start on this Metagross. So now we're going to be able to outpace the Metagross. As you see, it is a Metagross in the back. My read was correct. And here, you could argue that I could have baited. In Lifetime, I was thinking I should be able to survive long enough to get to two high horsepowers. Um, and he does shield that. So if I Avalanche bait there, I get to this high horsepower very comfortably. But my Mammo Swine pulls it off in the end. And on one HP, we get to the second high horsepower and we take the win. So a bait would have made it a closer game there but again what I'm trying to say is by reading that that matchup there if I shield that Gyarados in the Hexorus matchup the opponent very likely either a farms down my Gyarados gets basically almost two meteor mashes tanks the crunch double meteor mashes my Mamoswine or he comes in with a Metagross into the Gyarados and I, I panic and probably realize that after one or two bullet punches that I need to get my Mamoswine in there and then he just simply outpaces me. So by reading the team line there, I was able to recognize they were double weak to the to my Gyarados lead. They very likely had a Metagross and then I was able to manage my shields and energy in the endgame to win that match. So again, honestly, sometimes simply winning, you just have to predict the team and sometimes you get it wrong. Let's say the opponent just had a random backline that was not a Metagross. Maybe I lose because I don't shield the Gyarados. But again, you just have to give it your best shot and kind of stick with it. So that being said, guys, I hope this video wasn't too boring. I, I know that I did pause quite a bit. But again, let me know in the comments what you think of this format. I truly hope that this was helpful to at least one person out there. Maybe it's something that you knew but you just hadn't heard in a while. Maybe it's all new information. But whatever the, uh, the situation please give me some feedback in the comments and again thank you so much for watching i will definitely not be doing this every video we will be getting back into our original format in my next video for sure but let me know if you'd like to see some maybe more in-depth tactics or maybe even breaking down one of these individual tactics into more detail in the future so i definitely want to do something about move timing in the future as well so that being said thanks again and remember the more subscribers we can get the more Pokemon my wife will let me play.